gods of old in which so many people died for in which the world circulates around such as the wooden and thought Phrygia, Mars Jupiter, Mercury so many of our days of the weeks and months and solar system is named after And our advertisements, Nike and such things, idolatrous symbols. People died for these gods. You can see many movies about them, how they reverence them and worship them. And they created stories about the demigods, the sons of the fallen and daughters of the fallen. Hercules, son of Zeus. Achilles, whose mother was a goddess of the swamp. And the list goes on. Ulysses, who had favor with the goddess heaven. In the Bible, you hear about the temple of Diana, of the Ephesians. The star, where Easter comes from. The Queen of Heaven. In Africa, they call it the Queen of the Coast. But that same religion that you read in the prophets still remains today. Neptune, God of the Sea. Hermes, the God of Knowledge and Messenger. I often found it strange that in Bible college, they have Bible science, what they call in most colleges, hermeneutics. And I found that strange to call the science of the Bible hermeneutics, meaning breaking it down by the letter. 
the word of God that represents the living God, but yet they call the particular study of that God by the name of a false God. That's why in our Bible school we call it Bible and science. But I'm saying this because people that lived, empires that were built, were built upon the faith of these gods. They were as real as the sun and the moon to them. But today, every god I name is now called mythology. And even the countries that once worshipped these gods call them a myth. Because there is no scientific nor historical account that these gods ever existed. All the temples are built by the hands of men. Just last year, I was shocked when ISIS was over there in the uh, Islamic countries, I think it was Iraq, and they bombed some sacred temples. And boy, I was so surprised when they said they bombed the ancient temple of Baal. It touched my heart. That Bible is something else. They still had an original temple of Baal standing. Well, the temples outlived the gods because they were gods made with men's hands. And to this day, all of these gods are considered myths. Even in the countries that once worshipped them, they call it mythology. Because there is no scientific or historical proof or evidence left to prove that these gods truly existed as they said. Of course, we know that these images were inspired by demonic influences. They are still around. But the gods as reported are not. However, there is a god that was established back then and nature and science still supports it. All the facts and evidence and history proves it. And to this day, we can prove it. We still see his manifestations and we still call upon his name. Because he has outlived every myth. Every absolute virtue. Every faith. And for thousands of years, they've tried to prove the workings of his hands wrong and they are dying trying to do so. Because men made of clay, men that are considered pots and pottery, can't destroy the potter who has made us. We serve the only God that still stands. His name is Jesus Christ in every language. He still stands. He has stood the test of science and of history. And I feel so foolish even saying this. Because if you were to say, well, how do you know he's real? I'd call you a fool. Because a fool says in his heart, there is no God. If he's not real, then you don't exist. When we try to destroy the image of Christ, we destroy our very existence. For by him, we do live and have our meaning and our being. Church, they praise the Lord. And yet you've got men wrecking their heads trying to prove and explain God, and yet we can't explain ourselves. Is anybody hearing me? He said, from dust we come. Can anybody finish that? Dust we return. And you know what's so powerful about that is that it doesn't make a difference what your religion is. You're going back to dust. I feel virtue. And so let's get past the, the ignorance of debating if that's a God or not. Please. The word of God is the only reference that we have that explains it to a T. The Word of God is the only book that God himself first began to write. He was the first to write the scriptures, and then he commanded man to do so. I feel a virtue. Do you understand me? This is why he said, my spirit, my word is spirit, and it is life. Church, say praise the Lord. That's why the Word of God is spirit, and it is alive, because it was first written by a spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then the scripture says, the holy men of old wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Church, they praise the Lord. And so I wish to preach today by that same spirit. Church, they praise the Lord. If you doubt the existence of it, I have no ear to hear. Church, they praise the Lord. Bible says avoid foolishness. Uh, James chapter 5. I often said when I was a young man, some of you heard me say this, in the time of stress 
and in the time of oppression. That if you will keep washing the dishes, the table will clear. I was out of a job when I was younger, young man. Uh, when I first saw the revelation of Jesus' name, I, I wasn't allowed to work for a whole year, but I would go to church. And every time I go to church, somebody would put money in my hands. I would bring that home and feed the family, my wife, a few children we had, and I am lost at a little bit. As a matter of fact, every week I went out, every night they gave me $10. I'd get, come home, get up to mom and pray over it. And believe me, it fed us almost a year. She prayed and multiplied that thing. And we had an in-laws living with us that were not saved. And I used to say to myself, Lord, I'm wondering if my in-laws realize that off of $10 a week, this was back in the 70s, that we have been eating and that I don't have a job. They weren't contributing at the time and that the Lord was providing for us. I said, I wonder do they realize that you're doing this? And one day I didn't have the money. And they looked at their sister and they said, Sam, where did that $10 Larry be bringing home? <laughs> Hallelujah to God. So then they understood that God was, was providing. And so we were at the office and the children were getting a checkup. And uh, I was led of the Lord to fast and pray half a day for a whole year. And that's when he taught me the apostle doctrine. I was not called by the will of man, but I was not taught by man. I've never been taught the apostle doctrine. Uh, my degree was given to me uh, through several doctors uh, based on life experience and different literatures and writings that I provided. Uh, uh, it was an honorable, it was a real doctor degree in religious literature, but not because somebody taught me. The one doctor said, give the man what he's already earned. Of a lifetime of work. But I, I was taught by divine revelation, the apostle's doctrine. When I entered into the apostle's doctrine to believe, they were astonished, the elders, because they said, how is it that you just came, but we never taught you? You know the doctrine better than we do, if not more. And many young convert, I had no explanation except the Lord taught me. Church, they prayed the Lord. And he gave me understanding when I was with Kajik. Six months into Kajik, I never could make it to a conference floor because all the elders got word that there was a young man who came from the church of Nazarene. Uh, God took me through a journey, pursuing truth. And they said, he's sharp in the word. So you... Uh, back then, back at William Temple, mm -hmm. they'd be in there for a conference and you might see a, a white Cadillac, a Cadillac pull up, and a couple of elders would get out, and I'd be standing at the door. They said, You ready, young blood? I said, I'm ready. And we go up to the third floor while they have a conference, and we debate the coming of the Lord and, and things God was revealing to me. We would debate, and I was young and, and not being brought up in the church structure, so I was kind of rude. And, we would debate and the elders would bring out the commentaries and they books and I say, and I would look at them, I was about 19 or 20, I said, man, that's not fair. They said, what do you mean, Brother Larry? I said, you men are bringing to me all these books, talking all this stuff, y'all call the elders. I said, but all I got is the word of God. They said, well, these are learned men. I said, okay, how learned they are, you guys ain't fair. I didn't understand at the time. And they said, well, Larry, you, you, you got some knowledge, but you need to learn to talk to your elders. I said, what am I saying wrong? They were right, but I was young. I didn't know. But I was taught, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I'm going to tell you. I was taught the basis of doctrine by the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. And don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we don't need teachers. God has his purpose for everyone. Church, they pray for the Lord. Because everybody's not going to be taught directly by the Holy Ghost. They weren't taught directly by the Holy Ghost in the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? Paul said we got 10,000 teachers, but now you only got one father in the gospel. You understand? But we have a ministry called pastor teachers to teach the flock. You hear what I'm saying? They've been commanded to feed the flock of God, to teach the flock of God. But depending on your calling and, and on your ministry, and my ministry being that of an apostle, I had to follow the traits 
of, of, of a foundation laid. Church say praise the Lord. And and uh, for my for my calling that he had for me. You understand what I'm saying? And so that's why uh, you may have been to several apostle doctrine so-called churches and you hear some different teaching. It's because they teach traditions of men. However, as we, we were there at the clinic and they were getting the kids checked up and I was inside the car and I needed a job bad. I looked at the trees, how tall they were. And I said, Lord, I know you got a job for me somewhere. You created all these trees and you've done all these things. I know you got a job for me somewhere. And so when we got home, the phone rang. And the brother said, Brother Larry, you need a job? I said, Man, I should. They said, It's a dishwasher job. The man want to know when you can start. I had this old car that my stepdad gave me. I said, Tell him I can start today. And uh, the man laughed and said, No, you can come in tomorrow. And I, I did. I started as a dishwasher. I had an old electric 225, due to the corner. My stepdad, my, 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 my father-in-law rather let me drive it. But what he didn't tell me was, well, you know, he was an old school mechanic. Some of them old cars, they put real thick oil in it to keep it from ticking. He didn't tell me that. So I decided, well, I got this job now. I'm going to take this deuce, go get it tuned up. I drove up there real smooth. It was fine. When I came out to get it, the guys were laughing at me. The mechanics were laughing at me, saying, man, why didn't you tell me this car was that old? I drove in, something real smooth. But when I went back to get it, it was blah, 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 just a click. And I told my, my father-in-law, which was always getting on me sometimes, I told the chief, the chief, he, stood, he came and cranked the car up, blah, blah, and said, what? What did you do? I said, I took the car to get a tune up. He said, you don't take that car to get no children like that. I had extra thick walls in there to keep it quiet. I said, you didn't tell me. You, well, you tore up my car. I looked at old chief. I, he, he always had a problem with me. Everybody, he used to drink a lot, but he was a beautiful man. At, at, but everybody used to run from him but me. Because I, I loved him so much. He, I didn't run from him when he was drinking. Everybody thought I was so brave, you know. And, and he said, Bob, you tore the car up. And I said, Daddy Marshall. It seemed to me the car was already tore up. Clack, clack, clack. So what's the moral of that part of the story? Some things is best to leave alone. That's out of my bed. Just leave it alone. And so I started washing dishes. And, and uh, getting all wet, water everywhere, and putting the dishes and the cups on the rackets, jumping all in your face, though you've been in a restaurant, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not dealing with that whole bar. And all the dishwashers getting wet, and they used to call the dishwashers dish pigs. Everybody got their scandal, you know? Restaurants got their scandal. And they used to call them dish pigs. I said, why they call y'all dish pigs? Well, man, look at us. Water coming everywhere, and I'm behind that dishwasher. I said to myself, well, I gotta be a dish pig. So you know what I did? When I came to work, I cleaned the station up first. And yet I still kept getting splashed on this and that. I said, hold on. And, and dishes were piling up. Those of you that know restaurant talk, when you fall behind, they call it getting snowed. You snowed in. I said, now wait a minute, Lord. This is just too much for me. I, I got to do something. So I thought about it. I said, I'm going to come up with a, what's the word I'm trying to find? A system. I'm going to let them bring in eight tubs. After eight tubs, your restaurant manager, you know. After eight tubs, I'm not gonna worry about the rest. I'm gonna clear these eight tubs, and then I'm gonna send them through, put them up, and I'm not gonna worry about what they bring in. And so I started my system, and it worked. Then I could go to work, clean up my station with just my white shirt and black pants on, and, and come out just as dry as a, before I went in there. I know y'all think it's funny, but I went from that job to the next job. I became a professional dishwasher. Oh yeah, I did. They said this man never gets snowed. I don't care who I work for. Shawnee's, Howard Johnson. Hey, Amen. Those of you that know restaurant business, I, I used to just wash a three thousand dollar shift with just one dishwasher, one whole bar. And by the time it was over with, I was ready to leave with everybody else. Plus, made extra money because when the banquet people brought their dishes in, I got it out real quick. 
The manager was so shocked. He was an Indian man. He jumped three feet off the floor. This boy was great. And the young boys that were there, when they saw that one man did it, they jumped on it too. But it was all in my mind. It was all in my mind how I looked at it. And I learned patience from washing dishes. I washed dishes up so well, and I'm only speaking of the food. I came to one dentist, and there was another older gentleman who was well known in his district for washing dishes, but here comes the church boy. One manager went back and said, I went back and watched him wash dishes. He's singing songs. I'm just a shout and praising God. Another one went back and said, I can't believe it, because I would work 11 to 7 sometimes. And they said, This man is washing dishes, sleep. I was asleep. Lord kept me. And this guy got so intimidated, he stole some money and walked off the job. And they came and said, somebody stole money. And they went to check everybody. When they came to check me, the man said, no, don't check him. Don't even dare question him, because he didn't take it. The guy got jealous. I felt real bad. He and his pots looked better than mine. No, no. But nevertheless, I learned patience. Anybody hear me? Through washing dishes. And I could cook, but I didn't want to cook man sometimes too much drama. I would stay by myself. And I don't care how much it was, I never got snowed because I kept that uh, policy. When I was working for Dennis as a dishwasher, and I'd come in and preach to the manager two hours before I started working. And, and, and they would say, we need this. He said, don't worry about the Larry's here. And in 30 minutes, I had that place clear. In 30 minutes, I had everything back there. You see, I'd come in in that night shift and tubs all over the place, and the managers would, oh, we're so sorry, and I learned to respect management, being a ruler myself. I said, don't worry about it, sir. We don't need to leave. I said, don't even worry about it. I take care of it. Your attitude will take you a long way. Keep you from getting fired, too. You hear what I'm saying? And I learned that if you keep washing the dishes, what did I say? What did I say? The table will clear. Just don't stop washing. Keep moving. Keep moving. Learn from your life experiences. Because they can teach you good spiritual habits. If you learn from them. This is why Jesus taught a many spiritual things by using earthly situations. And the kingdom of heaven is like into a sawyer who went forth to plant, to sow. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who found a field with a pearl on it of a great price. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a wedding. The kingdom of heaven is likened to is likened to. The kingdom of heaven is likened to what you go through day to day. You understand what I'm saying? God, what's my lesson for the kingdom in what I'm doing? And so I'm trying to get the mission reach out to ready. Cutting two acres with a hand on them. I was out there eight hours yesterday. That's why I look so weird now. Cutting the grass so thick. Got half of it done. Still got a trail, but I got half of it done two more days and I have to complete it. But it got to the point where whew, I said to myself, Lord, then I caught myself. Maybe I'll get a ride now. I'll, I said, but you know what? I'm going to cut this grass. Because if I keep washing the dishes, the table will clear. Yeah. 